Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Friday, September 24th edition of the Basement Academy. As we wrap up this week of reflections, uh, we wrap up a set of weeks of reflections on critical race theory, and then these last three weeks, well, if it's not critical race theory is the answer, then then what is it? Uh, thanks to the many who have hung in uh, for the whole time. Uh, it's been a little wonky in places, certainly at the beginning, uh, going back to the Frankfurt School and some of the uh, intellectual philosophical roots of critical theory that turned into critical race theory. Uh, probably been a little wobbly in places as the pastoral thoughts have gone in several directions. Um, hopefully there has been something of benefit. Um, at the end, when I get to the end of a, a series like this in particular, it still feels like there's so much to do because there is so much to do. Because our world continues, our culture continues in such a great need. And so uh, we may end the reflections, but we don't end the work. In fact, I think the work really begins. And I've, I've had some conversation with the Wednesday group, uh, you know, praying, thinking, hoping that there will be some effort that arises out of this uh, conversation and this discussion that would lead us in arena one and two to uh, expressing um, compassion and justice and kindness uh, in our community. Well, let's begin with the psalm, uh, Psalm 54, a short psalm. This says it's for the director of music with stringed instruments, a masculine of David, a certain kind of song. When the Ziphites had gone to Saul and said, is not David hiding among us? The heading is actually almost as long as the psalm itself. And so Psalm 54. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Strangers are attacking me. Ruthless men seek my life. Men without regard for God. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from all my troubles, and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. Amen. Psalm 54, you hear that when, when Saul is pursuing David. This is another one of those psalms, those prayers, cries out for God's help and deliverance, vindication, vindicate me, O God, by your might. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. That would be a great verse to memorize, I think. Again, praying the Psalms daily, we keep these words uh, in front of us. They become our words, our prayers. And so in all aspects of life, <laughs> morning, noon, and night, winter, spring, summer, fall, whatever season of life you are in, whatever circumstances you find yourself it is good to pray that God, surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. May it ever be so. And certainly as we think about uh, the suffering, the reality, the brokenness of our world, may more and more people come to know that God is their help. God is the one who sustains. And may our witness as individuals and as a church family at Greenwich, may our witness lead to such hope and such uh, confidence uh, in that, that, that the people we know. So, all right, let's wrap up. Um, many weeks of thinking about critical race theory uh, and three weeks in particular of kind of thinking about what do we do if we don't embrace critical race theory, what do we do? And, and I kind of want to close with some kind of interesting thoughts in a different direction. And so I, I begin with a, a thought exercise that I've developed over the years. It, it's something that I engage in from time to time and periodically in conversation 
uh, pastoral conversation with folks, I will engage in this thought exercise, okay? Imagine Daniel or his buddies, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or just some person whom will never know their name, a faithful Israelite living their life, scratching out a living, you know, kind of tilling the earth, keeping the flocks, going about their business. They've heard what's happening in the temple. They've heard that these other statues and idols have, have, have come in to the temple, that the priests have welcomed in and have actually physically, somebody had to carry these things into the temple, these other statues and these idols. Uh, there was a practice of child sacrifice that had begun. It was, it was practiced by other uh, surrounding nations and Israel had begun to adopt that. And so imagine going out to uh, till the garden, right? To, to, to work in the field, Someday, having said your prayers, having read Torah, having said your Psalms, okay, a faithful Israeli, a faithful Jew who is trusting in God and, and, and living by the, 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 the commandments of Moses and smelling the burning flesh that is wafting out over the community. So imagine yourself into such a scenario where you are faithful, but a corruption has taken place in your society. Um, a, a, a great evil has taken place, but you are powerless to do anything about it. It is, it is beyond you. And then <laughs> the hoofs of the Babylonian horses come. And so you hear the, the army marching and here they come and they lay siege to Jerusalem and eventually they they breach the walls and and they they they, they sack the, the the temple the temple is destroyed um, and and there's the horror the 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 the, the fright uh, of all of that you've just been living your life you've been faithful <laughs> saying your prayers and over time your community, your society, your culture collapses. And then all of a sudden, you're rounded up. You and perhaps your family, sometimes families were separated. It was only the younger men sometimes that were taken off. So, so some were actually left behind uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem. But now you find yourself in Babylon, and, and you don't understand this language. You, you hear a language that you do not understand, and you, you find your way towards other exiles, other fellow Jews. That scenario of trying to live faithfully, but being caught up in um, something that's bigger than yourself, a cultural moment, as, as I sometimes will refer to it. There were faithful Israelites. Not all had sold out, right? Not all were idolaters. There were some faithful people. A faithful remnant is the language that we read uh, in the Old Testament and the prophets. We may be in such a moment, okay? We don't know the future, so we don't know where this thing is going, right? We don't know what's happening in American society, American culture, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years downstream, okay? There are things going on now that could not have been imagined two, five, 10, 20 years ago. The, 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 the corruption um, of our media, the, the invention of these phones that now allows um, all kinds of, of material to be in front of our children and, and ourselves, right? You can't imagine, we, th these things could not have been imagined, except maybe in science fiction, right? But here they are. And then the, 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 the transformation of our society where that which has 
historically and for millennia, for 6,000 years understood to be wrong, is now celebrated as right. And the gender identity, gender confusion, who could have imagined all of this? And where's it going? Two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years downstream. Can you tell me? I, I don't know. I don't think it's good. The trajectory seems to be that, you know, people talk about the, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. Who? Where'd you come up with that one? <laughs> Humans left to themselves bend towards injustice, bend towards brokenness. Oh, technology may increase, but now we have greater means to, to transform our society in, in, in corrupt ways. And so that thought exercise is where I kind of want to land. <clears throat> Critical race theory is part of something bigger. It's been brewing for a hundred plus years, right? Marx and then those who were influenced by Marx gathering in this small little building in Frankfurt, Germany. <laughs> These Jewish Marxist philosophers, all of a sudden they're run out because of Hitler. Who saw Hitler coming, right? All of a sudden they land in the US and other places. All of a sudden uh, their teaching and their thinking starts to take root and all of a sudden it spreads. And so all of now it's influencing higher education and people are being trained in these kind of new way of thinking about life and oppression and economics and society. And all of a sudden, these people are now populating the boards of other institutions. All of a sudden, we find ourselves here. And now there's this cultural moment that is sweeping, the cultural tsunami, right? This, <clears throat> this way, this earthquake happened uh, some time ago, and all of a sudden it travels across the ocean and then boom, the, 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 the waters uh, sweep, unsuspecting, innocent, just people minding their business. Folks like you and me, just minding our business, just going about our day, trying to love God, love our neighbor, scratch out a living. And then all of a sudden we are being accused of things that I don't, I don't understand this. And so we're being swept away in a cultural moment that is beyond our control. It's beyond our control. We don't have the ability to, to stop the tide, okay? We can pray for God to have mercy. But at a certain point, you're, you're, you reach the tipping point, right? They talk about it. And so all of a sudden, boom, this cultural moment is upon us. An old uh, friend of mine, uh, Jim Witt, uh, coached with him in Little League. Uh, Jim was the head coach. I kept the stats and all that. And remember telling the kids, and it, it, it is it's, it certainly hung with my kid, uh, with, with Turner. He said, boys, it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond or how you react to what happens. He said, that ump's going to call up, make a, a, a call that you're not going to agree with. The ball's going to drop. Something's going to happen. He said, not only on the ball field, but this is a, something's true for life. It's not what happens to you. It's how you react to what happens to you that's going to make the difference. Uh, that, that made such an impression on my son that that became part of his college essay. <laughs> As he uh, sought entrance into Washington and Lee, he did get in, thankfully, and enjoyed that time. It's not what happens to you. It's how you react to what happens to you. This cultural moment is upon us. Critical race theory is here. And it's really going to be here to say that, 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 that we've reached the tipping point, that the institutions of our culture have been captured by those who are enamored of critical theory, who, who have rejected a, a Judeo-Christian and frankly, in many places, a constitutional framework, right? And so we're seeing this for a variety of dynamics, again, some of which I think are um, ulterior motives. Again, corporations going woke, buying into this stuff, partly for the profit motive. Okay. It's going to, it, it, it's performative. It makes them look more righteous than they are. So they can kind of not, you know, have folks look at other practices they may be engaged in. So for whatever reason, the world is going woke. Our society is going woke. It is, it is buying into critical theory and these, these dynamics. And, and so it's not what happens, it's how we respond to what happens, okay? And so that's what I want to think with for a moment. We must resist the temptation to be angry and to resign. <laughs> the the temp temptation to anger, I, I, I get that there's a churn, but we can't just sit and stew and be angry. It will produce nothing. 
the anger of man achieves nothing, <laughs> right? Um, James uh, counsels us. <clears throat> uh, our, our anger is not going to accomplish things. We're going to need more productive, uh, more faithful responses, okay? We have to prepare for this moment. We have to prepare for the two, five, 10 year, 20 year thing that may happen. If it never happens, hallelujah. We've become vigilant and thoughtful and, and prepared. We must resist the temptation to anger around these things. We're past the tipping point. That You can't just scream at anybody. There's no one person. There's a force. There's something else at work in our society. We're not going to recapture America. That is not going to happen, friends. You must stop thinking that way. If you think that way, you must stop thinking that way. It's past that moment. We must prepare for something else that is coming. We don't know what, but we're not going to turn back the clock. We're not going to make America anything again, right? It is, it is something is taking us forward, okay? And so we must also resist the temptation to resignation. I am not calling for passive resignation. Okay, well, the tsunami's come. I'm just going to drift here and then I'm just going to die in the flood. No, I think we swim, okay? I think we paddle to shore. We do, we, we do what we have to do. There's work involved. And so we must resist the temptation to anger. We must resist the temptation to a passive resignation, okay? It, it, it's going to take work, okay? Uh, I want to read a passage from 1 Peter who addressed his audience as uh, uh, strangers, right? <laughs> to God's elect strangers in the world scattered throughout these various provinces. I think this is a word to the church today, okay? The faithful remnant, okay? By God's grace, we will be a part of that. By God's grace, we will not be deceived. As the priests of Israel were deceived in Daniel's time, they thought they were doing the right thing. <laughs> they were deceived. They were false prophets, they were false priests, and they were judged for it. So, so there are plenty of folks who name the name of Christ that may not be part of the faithful remnant, okay? That's, a, that's for another day. By God's mercy, we will be part of that faithful remnant, okay? And so, having already spoken to his audience um, as strangers in the world, already bid them uh, to uh, resist, right, uh, as aliens and strangers abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So he's speaking this way a little bit later in chapter two, just after the, the this war for your heart and mind that's going on. To this you were called. Well, to what? To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Well, what's he referring to? Suffering unjustly. Now, I know to my CRT and, and my, my, my advocates and, and, and my black friends, the thought that a straight white male Christian talking about suffering unjustly is laughable. Friends, I'm telling you, unjust suffering is coming to the faithful remnant of the church. Okay. And so to this, bearing up under unjust suffering, unjust accusations, this is what we're called to. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Okay, we talk about being followers of Christ. He is leading into a path where he suffered unjustly. We must be prepared to suffer unjustly in his name. And then he quotes, um, uh, he quotes Isaiah, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. Verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, that is Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. There's that word again, justice or justly. And so Christ suffered unjustly. We know that, right? I mean, that's our story, but we're so, we're so familiar with it, we forget. There was no sin. He was sinless. He was perfect. He did no wrong. 
the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders who, who tried to tempt, to, to t- uh, test him and trap him in things, he always confounded them. He told stories that kind of had them as the punchline and they kind of didn't always figure it out. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. I have not come to call the healthy. I've come to call the sick. You know, the healthy don't need a doctor, only the sick. If you, if you don't think you have any needs, then so be it. You know, Jesus was fine. But of course, they were deceived, right? And so they, they, they trumped up charges against him. They had him falsely arrested. Judas betrayed him, right? We know the story so well, but we forget his was a completely innocent suffering. Now, God willed it to be, which was, again, the mystery of the gospel of God, of Christ, that the, the innocent lamb of God would suffer for the world. But that's the plan. That's what all of that sacrificial system, the unblemished lamb, was just a foreshadowing of the unblemished lamb of God who would suffer for us. And so he set an example that we should follow in his steps. Christians always must be prepared to suffer unjustly for their faith. Follow Jesus, people. Follow Jesus. Stand, be an advocate of love and truth and justice. Reject the, the, the false doctrines of our world that, that, that blow about us. And so we must reject critical race theory. It is a false explanatory model and the ethics uh, that, that, that it proposes are wrong. And for those who will reject that, even though we do it kindly and graciously and with forbearance, but with firmness, there still may be a suffering. Again, we don't know what's happening in two, five, 10, 20 years. And so we must be prepared to follow in his steps as the apprentices of of Jesus Christ. So we should just run for the hills, Don, right? (laughs) We should just go build a new monastery and we should all go live in it or go find a commune and we can just raise, you know, raise our our crops and just have a, a little withdrawn community. No, that's not the plan of God. That's not the purpose of God. He leaves us here. He leaves us here in the world, but not of the world. We are not characterized by the, the world's values. We do not seek the world's aims and goals and ends. We live differently. We, we, we live by different truths, by different realities. And so we live an alternative life and it's hard work to do that because the world is always calling us to, to borrow and, and to buy into its way of thinking. And so violence and retaliation, when, um, when they hurled their insults, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. The just one will bring about justice in the world. A vertical justice, a horizontal justice. All of the corruption of our world one day will be exposed and revealed and judged and it will be set aside and God will bring his kingdom finally, fully and forever, a loving and just and true kingdom. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, to be the Daniel, so to speak, right? Live faithfully according to what we know to be true. Say our prayers, be about our our, our work. And so I want to close with a a quote from John Wesley, our, our Methodist friend, Wesley had a rule of life. Uh, We've talked about a rule of life, a rule for prayer, right? That was how we started this year back in January and February, uh, talking about praying the Psalms, a a practice, a discipline. It's a pattern, okay? So Wesley had a pattern for his life. He, 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 He had this way of thinking and it's, it, it, I'm sorry, I put it on the whiteboard. It's really small to get it all on there, but let me, I'll go ahead and read it. Do all the good you can, buy all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Hmm. Do all the good you can. That's often how it's kind of short 
It's kind of shortened that way. Do all the good you can as long as you can or something like that. You might hear it shortened that way. But the, but the full statement that, that Wesley would seek to live by, do all the good you can by all the means you can. So bring your means, wealth and resources in all the ways you can. Be creative and innovative in all the places you can. Arena one, arena two, arena three. Uh, in at all the times you can, as long as I have breath, today I will engage in doing good <clears throat> to all the people you can, friend, foe, neighbor, stranger, family, coworker, regardless of skin color, regardless of custom, regardless of religion, regardless of belief, to all the people you can, as long as as ever you can, as long as I have strength, as long as I can drag myself out of bed, I want to be about this work. And I think that's how I want to end this uh, set of reflections, these several weeks of reflections. <clears throat> it's here to stay. It's not going to accomplish good. It's going to be harmful. Critical race theory, it's going to be harmful. And because it won't bring about the good people will there will be agitation okay and so our society is going to become much more agitated uh, christians will get drawn into the agitation christians will get led astray by the teaching we must keep our heads it's not what happens it's how we respond to what happens we must imagine ourselves as the daniels <laughs> the faithful in the midst of the corruption that is unfolding around us. And we must continue to be faithful. And if we're called to suffer, then we must follow in his steps. He suffered for us. We will not hurl insults. We will not retaliate. We will not be angry. We will not seek violence. If we need suffer and lay down our lives, so be it. Martyrdom is still a call. It is still a legitimate calling. And while... We are about our lives. Let us do all the good we can by all the means we can in all the ways we can in all the places we can at all the times we can to all the people we can as long as ever we can. And let us do this purposefully, prayerfully, with intent and then go to bed each night resting, offering our, our lives to God and wake up and do it all again. So thank you for your attention over these many weeks. Hopefully it's been helpful. <clears throat> and uh, it might have all been for this right here, right? <laughs> this Wesley quote <clears throat> uh, that, that we did this. Um, we'll pick up with some new thoughts uh, in the coming week. Not 100% sure even where we'll go. Maybe turn back to a book study. Um, but let's close with prayer uh, for one another. Uh, for our communities uh, and for our nation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for a brother like John Wesley who can inspire us with these words, for a brother like Daniel who can stand firm in the moment uh, as he did, and for our elder brother, uh, Jesus the Christ, who set us an example, suffering for us and then calling us to follow in his steps, May we, be, may we be wise and faithful and compassionate and courageous, all that we need to live in this cultural moment to serve your good purposes. And so we offer these set of reflections to you and what you want to make of them in our lives and through our lives. We offer this all in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God inspire you through the power of his Holy Spirit to do all the good you can this day and forevermore. Amen.